Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, penultimate event uh, of the uh, Human Rights Center's uh, program, which is in itself part of the uh, Alumni Week here at Minnesota Law. Uh, I am delighted to see you here. Are we also Zooming it? No? Okay. I would have said uh, I'm delighted to see the millions uh, watching at home, but okay. Uh, my name is uh, Oren Gross. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs uh, here at the Law School, as well as the Chair of our International Law Concentration. I see many familiar faces uh, sitting in this uh, hall, so welcome. I'm especially uh, delighted to see you uh, here and to hear our uh, keynote speaker, Professor Anita Ramasastri, speak about corporate accountability uh, and human rights because this topic was particularly close to uh, my colleague, mentor, and dear, dear friend, uh, Professor uh, David Weisbrotz. Um, indeed, one of David's um, final publications uh, was a book chapter that dealt precisely with the topic uh, on which uh, we are going to uh, have the lecture today. But I would note, David was not a latecomer, an academic latecomer to the field. Uh, in fact, he was one of its pioneers, shepherding what was known as the draft norms on the responsibilities of transnational corporations and other business enterprises with regard to human rights, uh, issued 20 years ago by the UN Subcommission on the promotion and protection of human rights. David's legacy is abundantly evident uh, in those who are in attendance today, in his former students, and those um, such as practically the whole international law faculty here at Minnesota Law that he mentored. As well, I, I would say, the tens of thousands of pages that he authored and that in turn inspired others to write their own tracts and volumes uh, on topics that pushed forward and promoted human rights. But David was not only a human rights theoretician interested in, if you will, the law in the books. He was also a human rights activist who sought to ever improve the law in practice. And in his person, as well as in his writings and actions, David was the consummate Mr. Human Rights. Um, his legacy is also evident in the institutions and uh, frameworks that he uh, created and established. And 35 years ago, he created and served as the founding um, uh, director of the Human Rights Center here at Minnesota Law. In fact, I can tell you, yeah, sure, please. I can tell you that long before I knew about this law school, and long before I thought that I'll end up in this law school, uh, I knew about not only the Human Rights Center, but the Human Rights Library that David created. So the Human Rights Center is very much continuing David's legacy. And Professor Finola Nielain is the current academic director of the center. She's a world-leading scholar and expert in the fields of international law, human rights law, national security law, transitional justice, and feminist legal theory. She is a Regents Professor here at the University of Minnesota and the holder of the Robina Chair in Law, Public Policy and Society. She is also, I don't know when she has time, but she's also the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering terrorism. And in that capacity, she has recently held the very first ever UN visit to Guantanamo. Fanula, the floor is yours. Hi, 
everyone. We have a full house and that feels really great. Um, so uh, welcome to what, as um, uh, Professor Grass has said, uh, we, I think we should be calling Human Rights Day here at the law school as we celebrate our alumni who are coming back for their reunion. Um, but also because this is a really special day where we remember our friend, our colleague, our intellectual leader, um, Professor David Weisbrod. And it's a real honor to open up this keynote address on corporate accountability and human rights, which is dedicated in David's honor, um, and to celebrate his ongoing legacy at, in the work of the Human Rights Center. Thanks to David, thanks to the way he saw the world and the way he envisaged what we could do before we knew that we could do it, um, ours is one of the very first law schools in the country to have a human rights center and its long and distinguished history of advancing human rights, both nationally and internationally, was David's passion and focus throughout his time at the law school. Um, this afternoon, as we join together, and there's some um, frequent flyers in the room who started at 12 and are still with us this afternoon, um, we've been looking at issues of racial justice, of inequality, of human rights and the obligations of corporations, all of all things that were really close to David's heart, things that he felt really uh, strongly about. It's also true to say, and it's represented in my colleague and friend Anita, who's here, who'll be giving the keynote lecture, that UN work was, was at the heart of David's interests and passion, and it has remained at the heart of the Human Rights Center's focus. Um, the name of the law school's Human Rights Center is global. It's known wherever we go. David was the first American since Eleanor Roosevelt appointed to the UN Subcommission on Human Rights. And I am now, as Dean Grass said, I'm, I'm honored to have a, 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 a UN role as Special Rapporteur. All of that work throughout my time, but also through David's time, supported by the Human Rights Center. Um, this fall, I was in a remote meeting of the Security Council in New Delhi, and we had a side meeting with a group of human rights activists from across India. And this very elderly gentleman came up to me and he said, I knew David Weisbrod. And it was, he, he, he told me this long story about how over 30 years ago, he, was in, he came to Geneva and he came with a bundle of papers to talk about a problem of extrajudicial execution he had lists of names and details, and he didn't know what to do with them. And he encountered David Weisbrod, and David told him where to go and helped figure out a place for that to be lodged and addressed within the UN system. So everywhere we go, as faculty and as some of the students were talking about earlier, um, we hear David's name because he's remembered by so many who met him along the way. So in that ours is a tiny but mighty Human Rights Center, I want to acknowledge the Human Rights Center staff who are here today, Amanda Lyons, the executive director whose vision prompted today's, uh, the, all of it, the, all the pieces of it that we have um, culminating in this lecture, to Abby Nelson and Sarah Toon who, who have been instrumental in making it all work, to Megan Mannion who's a fellow at the center and my senior legal advisor. Uh, a small group of feminist women can do a lot of things, and they do a lot of things at the Human Rights Center at the University of Minnesota. We also, can we, yes, let's do that. <laughs> Before I introduce uh, uh, Anita and Professor Ramasastri, I do want to uh, say some more thanks to a couple of people. Some of our closest friends and supporters are with us today who've been the, the sort of, have helped the center and David uh, throughout the many years. I want to acknowledge Bill Drake, Sam Hines, Ben and Laura Cooper, Charlie Rounds, and, uh, and Mark Hermits. And I do also want to announce and take, say that we had enormous amounts of advice and help from former students and from supporters of the law school to make today happen. And there I want to acknowledge James Roth, Peter Thompson, Nicole Mohn, um, and Aman Obizdi, who were with us earlier today, um, all of whom made today possible by encouraging people to be here and by visioning what we were going to do. So we're now going to turn um, to do a, a small thing before we start the lecture, which is I want to play a video for you that the Human Rights Center commissioned to remember David's legacy. 
Um, the film is made by a former student, now noted filmmaker Hunter Johnson, son of Tom Johnson, uh, class of 1970. And this film is a lovely telling of David's life, his work, but also of the legacy he's left behind. And uh, many of you will see yourselves in the film. So before I introduce Anita, we'll watch a brief seven minute film. Thanks. I was starting my second year of law school when he started. I was able to observe the influence that he had on the development of international human rights at the University of Minnesota Law School because basically it went from nothing at the time I was in law school to now having one of the best uh, curricula on international human rights in the country and most likely in the world. David and I came at the very same moment in the fall of 1975. And over the years, uh, our families became close. We weren't just colleagues, but, but friends. We did traveling together. Well, I met David when I was a student at the University of Minnesota Law School. I found him engaged with the world, able to make effective change but also living a sustainable life outside of the hard work of human rights. David initially, to me, was just a faculty member, but then when I found out there was this common focus on human rights and also public interest, I got to know him better. And he developed right before my eyes into an international expert in the area of human rights. David was really creating the reputation of the law school. He built the center, he you know, brought renown to the university through the work he had been doing in the UN. We wouldn't be where we are today if it weren't for the work that he had done and the way that he had done it. There was no human rights focus in Minnesota, especially before he came. I know there was a legacy of civil rights with Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale. You know, there were people like Don Fraser who had a lot of passion and enthusiasm, but he was our leader. So that's how it all started. And it went on, like, forever. <laughs> if he saw something that needed attention, he was very visionary and creative in figuring out a way to do it. So I remember um, he heard about a center for victims of torture somewhere else in the world. And he said, well, why don't we have one of those in Minnesota? And he created an institution that to, to today is uh, very important and well-established and well-funded. And the same, I think, can be said for advocates for human rights. I brought uh, the the publication, the Human Rights Quarterly, which is where he always published his report of the subcommission. He was just an excellent diplomat, very down to earth, very kind of empathetic, understanding kind of uh, communication style, and at the same time, very strong, extremely strong, principled, and he wasn't going to give up. The elders used to say, still waters run deep, and David was a quiet person. He. Uh, Faced the most horrific situations, but he was not one of those hair on fire type of people. If you got to the point where you were ready to lose your composure because of a situation, David would go like this. And he didn't want you to just frazzle. He wanted you to stay composed and focused and be able to do the work offices next door to each other for more than 40 years, I could see the steady stream of students sometimes lined up outside his office to see him. He didn't hold himself in some kind of special uh, high regard, you know, in an academic sense above the students. That he had that, that sense of, hey, we are, we're, we're all working on this. I began to wonder if perhaps he would have some people who would be interested in the public interest area. Uh, as a career uh, and so he would bring me uh, the best people that he told me he could find. He was always an inspiration because he always came to us with the ideas. For instance the Human Rights Library was an, another thing where it started at Minnesota but its access was for the entire world. I ended up going to the law firm where 
um, Pat, David's wife, was practicing. And so I got to know them both. She was always a good colleague to talk to because she knew so much about so many things and she was very well traveled herself. What one man can do with his conviction and with his dedication and, and brute force, if you will, is what ultimately has made this great law school and the center have the reputation it has today. David really was vested in the work continuing. He nurtured and sought brilliant people to take his place. It's our expectation that the university will continue its brilliance, its courage, and its truth-telling on human rights. I think the students today, even if they've never met him or never had the privilege of studying with him, benefit from his legacy. The Human Rights Center and Professor Neil Lane and uh, Professor Green and others are carrying on his legacy, and that's, that's a very proud thing to be working on. So I think that the students who come here today um, should know about it and should be proud that they too can become part of that legacy because it's all about the future and the students. As far as I can tell, the future of the law school is in very good hands with the students today. We bask in David's reflected glory and the institution that he built. So there's a lot that we can be extremely proud of you know, even after his passing, it continues to be like a beacon in the world of international human rights. I think he deserves total credit for that because it just didn't exist before he came and built it. And that's just lovely. And it'll be up, uh, hopefully, on our website soon, very soon. <laughs> And um, yeah, really glad that we all got to start to watch that. And what a great way to kick off my formal introduction to uh, Professor Anita Ramasastri, uh, who's both a friend, a colleague, an extraordinary scholar on business and human rights. And it's really fitting that it's she who should be here to open this lecture. And, to, and, and part of that is because David Weisbrod shaped the work that she does, and she leads us in a lecture that remembers and honors his work today. Anita is the Henry M. Jackson Professor of Law and Director of Sustainable International Development uh, Graduate Program at the University of Washington School of Law. She's an expert in multiple fields. They include anti-corruption, commercial law, sustainable development, and business and human rights. She's not just a leading academic and pioneer in the field in business and human rights, but she practices at the hard edge of so many of these issues in so many of the hardest contexts in the world. Um, Anita's scholarship has been cited in two Supreme Court decisions focused on issues of corporate accountability for transnational human rights abuses. She's authored numerous expert studies which examine civil and criminal business liability for human rights violations in 16 jurisdictions. More recently, she chaired an expert panel of jurists to develop a corporate crime, princi corporate crime principles focused on what states should do to investigate and prosecute cases of broader corporate crimes uh, that have significant human rights impacts. And um, her UN work is quite extraordinary. And uh, when I began my role as Special Rapporteur, Anita was on the Coordination Committee, served as chair of that committee, has led not only in her own mandate, but in leading the system to work more effectively together. Um, she was a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, um, appointed as Rapporteur by the United uh, UN Human Rights Council in 2016, and she's been its chair. Um, she's also, in 2021, been appointed as the Special Representative on Combating Impunity, uh, Combating cor uh, cor uh, Corruption at the OSCE. And um, there are so many publications, uh, uh, editorial uh, responsibilities, 
uh, so many presidencies, including of the Uniform Law Commission uh, from 2017 to 2019, that I think we would eat into like almost the, uh, a lot of her lecture time if we were to go through it. But I, I just want to acknowledge what an, what an extraordinary scholar she is, her leadership domestically, her leadership internationally, and welcome her with the best Minnesota welcome that we can give her uh, to the university to honor us in this uh, lecture in memory of David Weisbrot. Thank you, Eva. Thanks. Great. Well, good afternoon, and it really is a delight to be here. And I have to say, it's a real delight to come from uh, Seattle, where it was still rainy and cold to such warm weather. It was a real treat when I got off the plane and I left my down jacket at home. I didn't, so it's a real Minnesota welcome. Thank you. So Associate Dean Gross, uh, Professor Neoling, thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you to your colleagues, Amanda Lyons and Abigail Nelson, for this chance to be here. I do have slides because I want to really represent today my remarks are going to be both personal, because what I think I'm going to share with you is the role that David has played in the field that I, too, have helped shape, which is this field of business and human rights, which is a relatively young field in the field of international law and human rights. So I'll talk about David's pivotal role, but really the legacy he's left. What can we see of his fingerprints and his intellectual architecture? What I'll also do is talk about the importance of social movements at the same time, what it takes for us to build that kind of a community. And we can think about anything. Many of you are probably interested in climate justice and the environmental movement. I'm interested in corporate accountability. And really, it is about the ties that bind and the role of academics, ad advocates, activists, all of us working together. Um, I, I listened to the career panel. It was great to see three different alums working in different areas. Michael, I know from his work in the private sphere. And sometimes we agree and we're on the same page. And other times, I'm saying, no, that's bad corporate policy, right? But we need each other, right? And we need that dialogue. And so I really want to commend uh, the University of Minnesota for just its role in bringing human rights to everybody locally and globally and David's role there. So I'll just begin by saying, in addition to David, who was a great mentor in the early phases of my career, I want to acknowledge a couple of other people who are here. Fanola, I had the great pleasure to work with at the United Nations. And you know we both have had challenging times and difficult mandates. But it was really that having those colleagues that made a difference. But I also want to mention uh, Professor and former Dean Bob Stein, who has been a mentor to me with the Uniform Law Commission and really pioneered in the importance of international law back here at home. So thank you, Bob. And I'm not sure if she's here right now, but Professor Jennifer Green, who the students I'm sure know and love. Uh, there you are, Jenny. So Jenny is, can I just say, Jenny, you're my hero, right? So like I met Jenny when she was a litigator dealing with corporate accountability cases and was so delighted when she came to Minnesota because she is an excellent lawyer and scholar. So again, it's just to say that these ties are just so amazing and why I think we keep doing this work. So as I sort of I wanted to just really, for some of you who might be new to this topic, what do we mean when we use these terms, business and human rights and corporate accountability? Well, as I heard in the earlier panel, you know, these words didn't exist a number of years ago. So we're really going to go back just only about 20 years, 25, 30 years, and we didn't have a vocabulary. We didn't talk about business and human rights. And we didn't even really talk about the other term that's often used by civil society, which is corporate accountability. So I just want to begin by saying, well, why should we care, right? What, what are the issues? Well, business and human rights is sort of shorthand for people who work in the field for this idea that there are corporations in the world, and those corporations work globally, right? They have global supply chains, right, that are bringing us vaccines and pharmaceuticals and food. And they have partners, and they invest overseas. Coca-Cola has you know, its presence, McDonald's everywhere. But they are also connected to human rights abuses, right? And that's the larger issue, is that big companies and small companies are connected to negative human rights impacts. So today, what are those issues in the newspaper? Well, as we rush to electric vehicles, I've got a Prius, right? We need cobalt, we need lithium, we need to make electric batteries. But what we're seeing is, of course, where does that come from? It's mined by children in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. What about human rights at home? This article up here on the screen from just a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times is about child labor in the United States, unaccompanied migrants that are now working illegally 
uh, in places like factories making Cheetos and Fruit of the Loom, cleaning up toxic chemicals and meat processing. So these issues of global supply chains and human rights violations are not just about somewhere far away. They reside here as well. And then we have here indigenous communities, right? They're also being impacted by this race for minerals. So lithium, for example, the scramble for the new white gold, indigenous communities are having their land uh, taken. They are dealing with issues of negative environmental impact. So just to say, what we're seeing is, is that companies have connections to human rights in a positive way sometimes, but often in a negative way. And this is what David and other people started to see in the late 1990s. But I want to step back now. So that's sort of today, just to say, should we care? And we heard from the alumni panel about things like China and Uyghur forced labor. But it's just to say, what responsibility should these companies have when they have those connections to human rights abuses? And we'll talk about what's the challenge there and why should we care? But just to say that the problem of transnational corporations in particular, those that operate across the globe in multiple jurisdictions and have lots of partnerships, runs deep and runs historically back a long time. So just a couple of history slides, because again, so for those of you who are like me, right, I've got the graying hair in the room, we remember some of this stuff. For the younger people, it's like really kind of a walk back in history. But when we talk about the 18th century, and William Dalrymple has written about this in a more recent book about the anarchy, the British East India Company in India was actually one of the beginning examples of sort of how companies use repression and human rights abuses as part of economic conquest, right? So this is not new, but it's only new in the sense that we've actually started to try to do something about it in terms of global solutions. Um, and then we have the end of the Second World War. So I'm not going to bore you and go through with these slides, but just to just put them up there as cues to say that we started to wake up to these issues of corporate power, which had existed since the time of colonialism, really after World War II. So after World War II, we have decolonization. Right? We have the rise of the new international order with the United Nations. So we have this beginning movement of human rights. But what we have is countries from the global south saying, well, the governments left, but the transnational companies didn't, right? So the transnational companies, the IBMs, the United Fruits, the others, they were able to go along with their colonial government partners into Latin America, into Africa, into, in, into Asia. They were able to go with favorable concessions, right? They were given the licenses to mine, to operate, to farm. They were the ones supplying us and still supply us with the bananas that we eat and the coffee. But they were able to stay and take advantage of the benefits of the economic investments they got because they were given to them by colonial powers. So in the 1950s and the 1960s, we started to see something that still exists today, the new international economic order and the belief among governments of the global south that the terms of trade and investment are inevitably unfair, right? That if you were a country, let's say in Latin America, which used the term banana republics, you were <clears throat> never advanced when you were colonized in terms of technology, right? So you lack sort of advanced market base, but what you have to trade are things that are gonna be cheap, people aren't gonna want lots of, and you're gonna to have to trade and sell bananas and sugar and commodities in exchange for the stuff that you really want, the computers, the cars, the mechanized farming equipment. And so it's always going to be a trap because you can't trade as many bananas for those things, right? So there is just there's this underlying critique in business and human rights, which doesn't relate to human rights, but relates to economic development and the relationship between the global north and the global south. But it's also the root of where we get the sort of beginning of the critique of transnational power. It's in the 50s and the 60s. And at the UN, there was a big debate over the power of transnational corporations. There was actually a center for transnational corporations. It's now called the UN uh, Conference on Trade and Development. But it was really focusing on the unfairness of international investment in trade. And so, States in the global south became concerned about transnational corporations and their power. And so that still exists today. I teach economic development. I teach sustainable development. And so there's still those debates. But it shifted when we get to the 80s. 
And that's just what I want to show you in terms of a history lesson, which is that in the 1980s, we start to see a shift and a focus, not just on the economic power of transnational corporations, but on the human rights impact of their activities. And so what I show you here is, those of you, again, who are older, as like me, will remember Union Carbide in Bhopal, India, right? That the explosion there, which led to the death of many, and then really a lack of access to effective remedy, it was a tort case, and Union Carbide, for its basically negligence, was sued in Texas court. And that's where Union Carbide was headquartered. But Union Carbide said, nope, the case belongs back in India. Law students and lawyers form non-convenience, right? It went right back to India, where there was a settlement, but to this day, there's additional uh, uh, attempts to gain greater access to justice because the victims got very little redress. So Bhopal, as sort of a major transnational tort, I want to say was sort of the beginning of the human rights movement waking up and saying, wait a minute, when there's a transnational company and there are victims in another jurisdiction who can't get access to remedy, what are we going to do about that? And that's when we start to see lawyers like Professor Green kind of spring into action, right? So what is the theme that I'm going to talk about for just the next few minutes? It's the so-called governance gap, that this is the problem that the business and human rights movement or the corporate accountability movement, if you grew up in my day, talk about, which is this idea that home state corporations, like transnational corporations, are headquartered, their parent companies are in countries like the United States, in Canada, in Europe. But the harm that they are connected to through subsidiaries or through supply chains is often in countries where the government, the host government, is unable or unwilling. So I'm going to use those terms, unable or unwilling, to provide access to remedy. The unable may be because of weak rule of law, court systems that may be corrupt, or just an inability because of the pressure of international inward investment to actually enforce strong laws, to protect workers, to protect child laborers, et cetera. So that, that's the unable category. And the unwilling are, are governments that are actively engaged in repression and partner with multinational companies and joint ventures and other kinds of activities, but certainly themselves are not going to provide remedy to their citizens or to people who are harmed in their jurisdiction, because why would they? So I'll just put, a, to give you an example, Myanmar as an example of that, right? So there's a military dictatorship, and so the government needs transnational corporations to make money, but isn't going to provide a court system for victims if there is any harm. So that's the governance gap that we're talking about, right? And so businesses can be direct perpetrators of human rights abuses, they can be connected to them, or they can be the partner of a government, like a Myanmar government, that may be the one that's the active repressor but the company is still reaping an economic benefit of that harm. So the challenge of this, right? So this is what David, this is what I, this is what Professor Green and others have dedicated much of their life to, is really closing that governance gap. It's saying if we are true to commitments to international human rights, people anywhere in the world should have access to effective remedy. And when we talk about these transnational harms, which can be civil, torts, or can sometimes be criminal in international crimes, right, if there's a conflict going on, for example, what are we going to do about it? And so this is what we are all focused on. So the question is, of course, states under international human rights law are the duty bearers. They're the ones responsible for dealing with this, and they should police their companies and provide adequate laws and good courts. But that's what we just talked about, the governance gap, that many states are unable or unwilling to do that. But yet we have transnational corporations headquartered in jurisdictions with stronger rule of law that should be doing something about it. But they, too, have not really been that active in sort of extraterritorial regulation for different reasons. There's the role of non-state actors. We've dealt with international armed groups, for example. They have certain obligations under international law. Why not companies? It's just an open question that we continue to debate. Who has jurisdiction over a transnational corporation? There is a challenge with the extraterritorial actions, and then there's just the inherent power politically of transnational corporations. And I'll just give you an example of that, which is that the tobacco treaty, because tobacco has a lot of power, 
had to be negotiated to prohibit tobacco companies from actually being able to participate in the treaty negotiations for fear, again, of the way in which they would sort of influence and the outcomes for public health of a treaty that deals with how tobacco can be marketed and sold uh, as a matter of public health. So where did the corporate accountability or business and human rights movement begin? So we wake up with Union Carbide, and in the 1990s, we wake up again. So how many of you are law students in the room? Okay. So for you law students, I'm just going to ask the two uh, women here, for example, can you imagine a world without the internet? No, right? Other students over here? Other students? You want to raise your hands? Could you imagine a world without the internet? You could? Like, like maybe when you go like on a family vacation and they say to you, put away your phone, right? Is that what you remember, right? But, 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 and so for the others in the room who are like, who else remembers the world without the internet, right? D did, we, did we survive? We did survive, right? <laughs> we survived, but I just want to say that, and I don't know if any of you, do you remember like we would get our news, obviously from the newspaper, right? The print, do you remember like Time Magazine? It would come every week or Newsweek, and, in the, and sometimes that's where you'd find out about a major crisis, right? Or on Sunday night, I would watch 60 Minutes with, uh, with my parents, right? And that's how I would learn about the world. Well, I want to say that one of the things the internet has done for human rights is that it made everything visible. So business and human rights, I want to say, grew up in the 1990s because suddenly the internet made it possible for us to see tragedy when it was happening. So finally, we saw pictures of kids making soccer balls for Nike in Pakistan. We saw pictures of, of sweatshops in Indonesia and Malaysia. We saw these things. And once you see them, you can't ignore them. There was Kathy Lee Gifford with child labor. She cried on TV about dresses at Walmart, right? So we saw all of this, right? We also had the opening of borders, the World Trade Organization and others. This was the sort of heyday of sort of liberalization. So the idea of the role of companies became more debated. And we had pioneering human rights litigation in the United States. So for those of you who've taken Professor Green's class, what you may remember is that there was a use of something called the Alien Tort Statute in the US. I'm not going to get into the weeds, but to say that it was the whole, some pioneering litigation where they said, let's bring cases against transnational corporations for violating international human rights right here in the United States. Okay? So they opened the door and they raised the issues at home. So let me just walk through just the 1990s, because this is when David got started with these issues. So we have here, these are just cartoons from that time, apparel sector sweatshop scandals in the 1990s. We have Nike and Gap. We have a new term that's coined in the 1990s called corporate complicity, that scholars started talking not only about companies as investors, but as accomplices, right? And for the criminal lawyers in the room, being an accomplice means that you are a partner in a criminal enterprise or a, right, with somebody else. So corporations were accused of being complicit in the human rights abuses of governments overseas. We have blood diamonds. Okay? Does anyone remember that? This was, again, conflict commodities. We still have them today, right? Conflict minerals. But we began to see commodities thanks to the pioneering work of NGOs. Right? And you know that when Leonardo DiCaprio makes a movie, right, if you're an NGO, that you really have made, a, made an impact, right? Because, you know, it's like NGO did the work, but Leonardo DiCaprio made the movie. But what you'll see here, for example, is that this was an NGO campaign from the 90s, Blood Diamonds, right? For every hand taken in marriage, a hand is taken, right? Because this, in, the, in the Civil War in Sierra Leone, amputation was used as a way to intimidate uh, people. But the main thing is to say that the Blood Diamonds fueled the conflict, right? This is just another slide. We had the litigation against multinational corporations for transnational harms. There were three big cases. And, and Jenny, which were the cases that you litigated? Unicow and Shell. And those are the two slides I had. I was trying to remember. So we had a cases relating to the Ogoni oil region and the extrajudicial killing of environmental activists with a connection to Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, litigation in the US that's taken a life that continues. We had a case against Unicow. Uh, which was about, again, a company focusing on oil and gas in Myanmar that was accused of being a partner of, of the Myanmar regime then. There's a new one, right? Uh, and, and basically benefiting from forced labor of the civilians in Burma to like clear roads and, to, and, and forests and other things. 
So we have the WTO anti-globalization protests in Seattle. Again, there's a movie for the younger generation because you weren't there. I was. But there was also this starting to critique, again, back to the trade and investment. There was the legacy of World War II, and this is where I came in, okay, that some of you may, again, remember that during the Second World War, but actually both in Japan and in the Far East tribunals and in the U.S., I'm sorry, not in the U.S., in Europe, uh, there are prosecutions of industrialists, Japanese and German industrialists, for their, their in, uh, involvement in war crimes, and most notably forced labor, right, that they actually employed and forced uh, victims uh, during the war to work in their factories. And so on the right there is a, you know, 24 uh, managers of one of the German conglomerates were tried in, at Nuremberg. And then there's a book uh, there just talking about the last deposit. And the reason I have those two images there is that in the 1990s, while Professor Green was litigating her cases against modern transnationals, there were similar litigation going on class action attorneys were bringing lawsuits against European and Japanese multinationals who had used and benefited from forced labor during the Second World War, but had never paid restitution to the victims, some of whom were still alive, others whose families were seeking that. And those cases were settled. I, my first article as an academic, and I remember David Weisbrot said, that's interesting, as did my dean, was called Secrets and Lies, Swiss Banks and International Human Rights. Now remember, this wasn't a field yet. So my dean was like, really, Ramasastri? And I'm like, I'm a banking lawyer. The banks are complicit. Like, I went and ran a tribunal in Switzerland to deal with the dormant accounts from the Second World War. But it's just to say that it's hard to ignore, right, this connection, right? When you go back to the Second World War, you can show the close connection between industry, uh, government, conflict and grave human rights abuses. So just to say that in the 90s, we were reminded of that because of lawsuits against these companies. And so that was the world we were living in in the 90s. The internet woke us up and, we could, we, and all of these things were happening, challenging corporate power, but doing it in relation to human rights, right? The World War II cases, Professor Green's cases, uh, the, the WTO, there was all of this focus on the human rights impacts of the transnational corporation. So scholars started to pivot at this time. So we have up here, I'm just going to put up here just for, again, those of you who are like, you got to talk about scholarship, Ramasastri. But this is to say, these are some of the early scholars that started to have us think about human rights. We have Peter McClinsky, who's writing a book that's not great bedtime reading, right? It's sort of dense but it's comprehensive on the law of multinational enterprises. We have Upendra Bakshi, who is at Warwick, an Indian scholar who wrote about Bhopal and what he calls market fundamentalisms. We have a colleague of mine who was on the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, Michael Addo, writing a book on human rights standards and the responsibility of transnational corporations. We have Menno Kamingo, 2000, an edited volume, Liability of Multinational Corporations. And then we have David Petrasek, who was a human rights advocate at Amnesty. He became a professor at Ottawa he wrote a seminal report called Beyond Volunteerism. So the pivot here is, remember the governance gap. Companies weren't required to do anything more than comply with local law. So if you were a multinational, whatever the law was in Myanmar, whatever the law is in North Korea, wherever the law is, wherever you are, is all you had to do. You didn't have to respect the law of your home country when you were overseas, and you didn't have to respect international human rights law. So local law was the bar, and it was low. So these scholars started to say, can we lift up corporations and either make them directly responsible, duty bearers, or can we at least get them to respect human rights wherever they go? That was the debate that these books and these things were saying. And to go beyond volunteerism. Companies were like, they always have had human rights pledges. They have codes of conduct, right? Citizens, good citizen pledges and CSR but they didn't have binding standards. That was the debate, and that was the one that they were in. And that's where Professor David Weisbrot entered the scene, right? And he really, through his work, helped us make that shift. Because scholars can write books, and they can write articles, and we can have great intellectual debates in our law review articles that a few people may read, and then we go to conferences and we debate more, and we still do that. But how are we patients to behave? How are you going to tame a transnational? So I was at a conference in the late 90s uh, in Maastricht in the Netherlands. 
where David started musing, because he was on the UN Subcommission on the Protection and Promotion of Human Rights, maybe we could all of the different human rights treaties and try to spell out how they apply to companies, right? Even if it's not required, even if there's not a treaty that makes them do that, at least let's spell it out. Right? Let's say that international labor standards apply to companies. Let's look at things like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Let's focus on how we can do this. So he drafted something called the Draft Norms on the Responsibilities of Transnational Corporations and Other Business Enterprises. Now, I would say that one thing that I would say if I had sort of I was a, a junior scholar, so I wasn't going to advise a senior scholar, but having now been in the UN system as an expert, I would say we needed a different name, right? The draft norms on the response, it just, for a corporate audience, didn't really roll off the tongue. But what it did was just a masterstroke, is it looked at all of the human rights treaties that we have out there, codes of conduct, regional treaties from the inter-American system, from Europe, from Africa, and it said, let's spell out for the business community what it would look like to respect human rights. And, I'm just, and so he tabled this with the idea that they would become sort of like soft law first, so not binding, but trying to change government's regulation of companies, so to wake up governments to say, you can pass laws that, that raise the bar and make companies do more about their supply chains. You can do that, right? You can. So governments wake up, companies wake up, and it's no longer enough. Look, you're getting sued by Professor Green, and you're doing right. You gotta actually respect human rights, right? It's not enough to do business in a repressive country and, and just say, well, we're complying with local law if local law is non existent or just incompatible. So he created the draft norms, and I'm just gonna just hear some of the preamble, right? Realizing the transnational corporations are also obligated to respect general responsibilities and norms. So he's just talking about kind of a general principle. Taking note of global trends about the influence of transnational corporations and other business enterprises. So he takes note. And I didn't excerpt it here, but he did have one sentence in there about how these norms would eventually become generally recognized. So there were a couple of sentences buried in this UN document that when the business community found out about it, so Michael, I'm gonna to turn to you just because you, you know companies. So let's go back in time, right? So if lawyers were advising their clients and they sort of saw these norms, what do you think frightened them? Yeah, they're like, we don't, I mean, if you imagine a corporate lawyer, they're gonna be like, we don't know all these treaties that are being cited here. But it was also this idea that through adoption and use, the norms would become customary international law. So for our international law scholars, there was this sort of aspiration embedded in the document that really made certain governments and certain companies say, ooh, this is dangerous. So what does the UN do, Professor Nealon, when they want to get, get rid of something? They get somebody nice to do it differently. Yeah, they do that. But before they do that, <laughs> <laughs> they get somebody nice, or do they, but do they kill it? The soft killing is they table it, right? They, they stopped to kill it. Yeah, they stopped to kill it. So they never took a vote on the draft norms. The draft norms actually quite, got quite a long way. You know, we were into 2003. There was lots of discussion and excitement. But then they got tabled, right? So that's what I mean, right? The norms drifted out. So my students will often come to class and be like, where are the norms? And I said, the norm, it wasn't like there was a vote. There was no norm election, right? The norms just were tabled. And what we had instead... I'll, I should just say here, what was the main ra rationale? These are just the things that David really focused on, right? Host states unwilling or unable to address systemic human rights abuses. Host states cannot stand up to powerful transnationals. Host states actively in repression. Corporate structures, corporate laws, still a barrier to access to remedy for victims because parents and subsidiary companies are separate legal entities. So you can't really sue the parent easily, as Professor Green knows from her years of litigating, right? Is it easy, Professor Green? Right. To, from, if, you're, if the harm happened where the subsidiary is located, suing the parent is really not easy. And then there are just the cha challenges, the cost, evidence gathering, I mean, just the whole notion of transnational human rights litigation. So the norms were an attempt to say, instead of like dealing with this through lawsuits, let's deal with this through respect for human rights at the front end and prevention. So the norms were tabled, and, and, they, and that's just because they were just a little bit before the UN's time in terms of where we were. 
So David has finger on the pulse. He found the problem. He created a solution that was really not meant to be binding, but sounded a little bit more binding than perhaps the UN and companies were ready for. And then in came someone who gets a lot of the credit these days, who's John Ruggie. John Ruggie was a professor at Harvard in the, in, in the School of Government, and he created a framework called the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which is what we talk a lot about today, and a framework called Protect, Respect, and Remedy. Now, I'm not going to go into that framework, because this lecture is not about John Ruggie. It's about David Weisbrot, which is to say that it was a soft law instrument itself as well, which meant that, but it did the same thing that David did, which is that basically Professor Weiss brought, and then Professor Ruggie said, companies, you need to, as part of what we're going to call your social license to operate, you need to benchmark your conduct around the world to a few key international human rights treaties, the covenants, the universal De declaration, so that, again, if you go to Saudi Arabia and you're dealing with gender issues, find a way to address gender rights. If you are dealing with children's issues and child labor in the cocoa sector, you need to address that. You need to try to allow workers to organize. You need to, and you can't use local law as an excuse anymore. So both David and John really raised the bar and opened the dialogue for companies and human rights. It may not seem to the students in this room like game changing. Although students, does it seem game changing to you? Yes, I hope so, right? Yeah. But, but you, you've, you've moved into a world of internet, you've got internet, and you have business and human rights, right? There's a journal, there's classes, right? But, but this didn't exist, right? I didn't have a class in business and human rights in law school. So I'm just going to conclude by saying, so I just want everyone to reflect that for one professor to have the clarity of vision, to take this and to bring it to the UN and to try to create a framework for addressing these transnational governance gaps, these union carbides, is tremendous. So you have to say it happened here. And that is the legacy. So I met David in the 1990s. Uh, in addition to him saying that's interesting when I talked about my scholarship, was that he empowered me to, to, to embark on the journey. And remember that slide where I listed the scholars? They were all men, just by the way, right? A challenge in the academy, right? Back 20 years ago, kind of the way it was. But I was one of the first people of the younger generation to write and one of the first women to write in the field, thanks to David, right? So he helped open up the space for new people. So what David did with the norms was singular, and I really want to say that. And then I just want to say, what is the legacy of the draft norms, right? Where, where do we go standing on the shoulders of David? Well, we keep going, right? That that's one of the things. Right? I showed you those slides in the beginning to say we have a long way to go, right? We haven't solved this problem. But what do we have? Well, we heard earlier from one of the alumni about the US. So the US is never going to be kind of the same as Europe, right? Just not, right? We're different. But we have our own binding laws that are attempting to deal with company supply chains. So now, if companies are importing goods into the United States, if they get a complaint from a civil society group that that commodity or those goods were made with forced labor, Customs and Border Protection can just seize those goods at the port. The company loses them unless they can prove, which they can't, that those tomatoes, that cotton, that polymer, for, right, whatever it is, is, is not made with forced labor. So again, we don't have lots of resources, but to understand that the US government can just seize the goods of a company Hey, and, uh, and take it away. They lose them. If they are made with forced labor and there's a sort of government order on that, that's big. What does that force companies to do? Clean up their supply chain. So there's a law that deals with weaker forced labor, but there's a much broader one. So on the web, on my slides here, I just have a, a map and just a web from the website, which just shows where there have been uh, orders issued for different kinds of commodities from the Congo, Malawi, Turkmenistan, India, Malaysia, and you go on, Mexico. Okay. So that's the United States. And the United States, again, because it's hard to legislate in a fractured Congress, right? So we have instead what the government calls multi-stakeholder initiatives. We basically have taken on issues like private security. You may remember Blackwater, right, from uh, uh, Iraq. We have 
the US, the UK, and Switzerland have a, started an industry code of conduct association for private and military security companies. It's called ICOCA. But what's amazing about that is if you want to contract with the US government for private security, right? Because remember, there's the army, but who guards our embassies? Private security contractors, right? That's what uh, Blackwater was doing in Iraq. You, they have to comply with the human rights standards of this organization. So the US government is saying, if you want our government contracts, the UK is saying that, then you have to respect human rights. So the US is embedding kind of David's vision in different things. Then we have the UN. So at the UN, my role as a rapporteur, like Professor Neoylan, was uh, as a member of something called the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. But after the norms were tabled, civil society didn't go to sleep. They're like, we want binding rules. We don't want to wait. We want binding rules for transnational companies. So led by Ecuador, there's been a treaty process going on at the UN Human Rights Council. You can see a picture here, rights for people, rules for transnational corporations. Here's another picture, right, uh, from a newspaper saying global south states and civil society keep up the momentum, right? So there's a treaty process going on. Now the treaty process for a long time, people have said, well, the US hasn't participated and you know, you're, the EU doesn't have a common position. But as I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides, now that Europe is beginning to regulate business and human rights, they're actually legislating, they're kind of waking up and being like, well, we should be influencing this treaty process. So what a difference a year can make. So the treaty process, we'll see. But, but it's there. And it's it, thanks to David's legacy that civil society is even trying to do this. And then just the last couple of slides, nationally and re regionally, we have national human rights legislation on modern slavery and on forced labor and other things. I'm not going to use this fancy term, human rights due diligence. I'm just going to say that there are laws in Europe now, in France, in Germany, that require companies, including American companies, to actually police their supply chains, meaning they have to identify and find human rights abuses and provide some way to prevent and remedy them. Okay. So just to say there are national laws, right? So back to Michael talking before, there's a whole host of things you can do as a corporate lawyer now in this field. The European Union is debating and is going to have in the next year or so a full directive. So the whole EU is now going to regulate business and human rights issues in global supply chains, right? So the US is doing its own thing because it does, but the EU is now moving. Litigation continues. The US, thanks to the Supreme Court in the United States, has narrowed the ability, again, I'm sorry to keep, you're my hero, Professor Green, to keep talking, to, 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 to sue transnational corporations in the US. The door has really narrowed. But it's opening in other parts of the world. So this is a, a headline from Canada, where a lawsuit against a mining company for forced labor in Eritrea in the mining sector not only led to a great judgment in the Supreme Court, but to a settlement as well. And there's litigation going on in different parts of Europe. So you shut one door, new doors open, thanks to David's work. And then finally, we have the idea of corporate accountability. Now, David may have, and we may have moved to business and human rights, but business and human rights, you know, sometimes people will write to me and say, does that mean businesses have human rights? You know, because they hear business and human rights. And I'm like, that's not really the field, because, you know, maybe we should have called it human rights and business. But the term that existed that David also used was corporate accountability. And we still see that, and I know there's one person who's worked with this organization in, in uh, one of your alumni, the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable, right? So civil society hasn't given up on the reason we're doing this, right? So I just want everyone to leave to say, why did David do this? It's not to just talk about it. It's to provide access to effective remedy for those harmed by companies and corporate power. And so I just want us to end by saying the world with, with the norms instead of the guiding principles. What would that look like? And I just want to say that the corporate accountability strand is still alive and that David's vision is now aligning with the guiding principles, that we now have a world of more binding rules, right? So the world is shifting. We have a new generation urging us to look again at hard law and treaties. And we have a new focus on what I call writing the economy. We have a whole group of scholars and activists that are saying, if you don't change corporate law, 
doesn't matter if you tell a company to respect human rights, because unless you deal with the issue of shareholders and investment in this, then we're never going to have the world that we want. So just to say that all of these issues are kind of the next set. So I'm going to stop there and just say, for me, David changed my life. And I hope that for many of you, he changed yours. Um, but we're all living with his legacy. So thank you.